Patrick Felton was a hard-working man, and he wanted to own his own land instead of renting from someone else. When he heard that the Mississippi Territory was open to homesteading, he decided the family would claim some land. They left North Carolina in 1833 with a wagon, two oxen, and a rose bush. When they got to the Tom Bigby River, the only way to get to the other side was to pull themselves across on a raft and a rope. Patrick, if this doesn't work and you go floating down that river, I am never going to speak to you again. Sally Felton swam to the bank and tied the rope to a big pine tree and pulled out the slack as Patrick pulled the raft across the river. When they got to a hill with a nice slope and a crystal clear spring, they decided to unpack and set up the homestead. They stayed in the woods for about eight months before going to a natural crossroads of Oscuba. When the railroad came through years later, the town was moved and renamed as Scuba. His wife Sally was not too happy about moving in the beginning. She had an eight-year-old son and a four-month-old baby girl to consider. When Patrick told her they had dense forests and big deer and millions of fat rabbits, she thought it sounded like the promised land and knew her deep love for him would only grow stronger. When it came time for Patrick Felton to officially claim his land, he had to go to Columbus, Mississippi. It took him nine days to make the journey as he found his way there on horseback. Granddad, uh, uh, Patrick now owned a square mile of land. As Patrick rode up the path home, he spotted three Indians attacking the cabin. One was on the roof stuffing pine needles into the chimney. He shot the Indian on the roof and the others ran off. As he rushed to the cabin, Sally threw open the door and ran toward him, crying hysterically. While he was gone, the ox broke loose and knocked down the fence around the deep spring well. Baby Tracy fell in and drowned. Sally did not want to bury her until Patrick returned. They started the Felton Cemetery burying Tracy and the Indian a few hundred feet from the cabin under a beautiful stand of oak trees. The Felton Cemetery tells a lot of the story about the Felton family. Patrick and Sally are buried there, and many of their descendants rest on top of the hill close to the old homestead. Walter B. Atkinson wrote a book describing the family's history with humor and empathy. He's a descendant of the Feltons and great-grandson of Bennett. Four of his great-uncles fought in the War of Northern Aggression. Uncle Eb was the youngest to join the Confederacy and would later rescue Bennett after Bennett's dad was killed. After the war, they witnessed a bloody time in Kemper County while order was restored to the area. It wasn't about slavery for them. It was about freedom and protecting the land and family they held dear. That's when Grandmama died in the 40s. Mom and Dad came out and bought the place where we were. We had a great big house, and there was a big room on the front. Granddad lived in the room up on the front. Uh, he lived in the room on the front. Lived there with us all, all, all the way till when he died uh, there, and he he would come eat breakfast with us. He had a chair on the front porch, and he had a certain place that he sat on the front porch, and he uh, taught me how to play checkers. I'd go to his room at night and, and play checkers. Of course, it took me forever figure out how to beat him. I don't think I beat him many times, but uh, he taught me when I was a little fella, seventh eighth grade, how to, how to play checkers and then how to uh, make all the moves and stuff on the checker table. And that was, that was the way that I learned to play checkers. And also, uh, another thing I remember about Granddad was that he uh, chewed brown mule tobacco, never spit, he, he chewed brown oh. new tobacco. When he died, he had a little spot uh. right here on the side, a little sort of a stained spot on the side of his cheek. Uh, but I, I have bought him many a <laughs> pack of brown new tobacco that uh, he chewed, always chewed. But he didn't chew very much. He wouldn't put, not like they do now, Stu, you know. Put a whole wall. No, he just put a, he just bite off just a little bitty piece and uh, put it in there and chew on it. And huh. that, that was it. Always had a walking stick and a straw hat. But mom and dad had got. Oh, mom and dad were either important or getting married. They walked from town to the Bennett place out here on the weekend. 
dad and them in there somewhere around the pool forks. They saw a deer track in the road. And they got up there and told Bennett. Bennett didn't believe them. <laughs> and they got in the road and walked back down there to show him. Uh, he walked with them back down there to show him because that would have been that would have been right before World War II started. There were no deer in here, you know. And Bennett was quite the character. Several men came to Scuba on the train to foot race him. He beat everyone he raced until he got older, and even then would race the young boys in town and beat them. Story goes, if I heard it correctly, that he laid down in the road and gave them a head start, and then he still got up and beat them. He attended Spring Hill Methodist Church when he didn't go to Waholic Baptist Church, and that is where he met Allie West. They finally married on May 9, 1915, by the Justice of the Peace, George E. Seiple. Bennett and Allie had five children. Bennett lived to be 89 years old and is buried in the Spring Hill United Methodist Cemetery. Too, back then, see, every square inch of this land in here, somebody lived on and farmed it. They just, they, Dad said there was no deer in here because I can remember, uh, you know, when we, when I was little and we went fox hunting with him at night, you know, we very seldom, this was in the pits, and we very seldom run into deer. But in my senior year, we came home one day and Granddaddy Bennett was not at the house. And we didn't know where he was, so we started looking for him. Uh, we came to the Joe Person's place to look, <coughs> to look for him. We looked all around everywhere and uh, to try to find him. Um, that day, sometime during the day, he had gone down through our pasture about a quarter of a mile to check the fence we had around a pond to make sure the cag wasn't get in there. Uh, he had a heart attack when he stooped over to look at it. He had a heart attack, fell dead and fell in the water. Uh, I was a senior in high school. I walked within about five or ten feet of him, but he was up under the bluff of the pond dam, so I didn't see him. Once we couldn't find him, it got dark. Coach Sullivan got all the football players together and all the boys at the college, and they came to our house and made a line arm distance apart and started walking back through the pasture. And uh, when they got there, well, some of them had lights, some of them didn't. When they got there and shined a the light there, they found him uh, laying in the laying in the pond there, uh, dead in the pond. And he, uh, they knew he died of a heart attack because the doctor that came examined him, uh, he didn't have any water in his lung. And he said, that, and he was also he was floating, so that meant that he didn't have any water in his lungs or anything. And he had lived with us all of his life, so that was quite a, he lived with us for about 15 years, so that was quite a loss for us. <laughs> Bennett's youngest son, Bill Bow, joined the Army Air Corps in 1942. He became a tech sergeant on the Jolly Roger. He was a member of a 10-man crew for B-24 Liberators and flew all over Europe in World War II. His plane was shot down, and Bill Bow didn't realize he was on fire when he had to eject from the aircraft. He survived and earned a Purple Heart and the Bronze Star for his bravery and courage. After the graduation ceremony, Judge Stennis spoke to Bilbo and told him how proud Kemper County was of their local war hero. Today the house is gone, the spring is filled in, but the rocks around the hole still remain. The rosebush Sally brought with her from North Carolina blooms every year around Father's Day. The trees were cleared this summer and hunting should be superb. Grandpa Patrick would be proud. It's a long way back to Scuba, Mississippi, for the family that lived on Bennett Hill. They lived a good life, and it's a beautiful property. It is far away from the hustle and bustle of life in the big city. There's a peacefulness on that hill, a family who loves as deep as the clear spring that ran beneath the hill.